Hello everyone, today I'm meeting a cosmologist at the University of Geneva who recently did a project about gravitational waves. Nice to meet you. Hi, my name is Camille, I am a cosmologist and a professor at the University of Geneva. First, can you tell us what is a gravitational wave? Ah, to understand what a gravitational wave is, we first need to understand how general relativity works. So the theory of general relativity is a theory of gravity that was invented by Einstein in 1915. And this theory postulates that our universe is not an absolute fixed frame in which objects are moving and living, but rather that it is malleable, that it is distorted by the matter that we put in it. So we can imagine the universe as an immense tablecloth and when we put a massive object in it, like for example a star, the universe is distorted. The presence of the star creates what we physicists call a gravitational wave. So space is distorted. In addition to that, the theory of general relativity tells us that the presence of the star also distorts the passing of time. So a clock will tick at a slower rate inside the gravitational wave than outside of it. So if I understand correctly, in the theory of general relativity, gravity is not a force but a distortion of space and time? Yes, exactly. And any object that we have in the universe will feel this distortion of space-time. So, for example, a planet close to a star will move in the most straight way possible in the gravitational wave. So it will turn around the star like if it were attracted by the star. We have the impression that there is a force attracting the planet, but in reality the planet is simply moving in a space that is distorted by the presence of the star. Now, a gravitational wave is also a distortion of space-time, but instead of being a localized distortion, like in the case of a star, it is a distortion that is propagating through the universe, like a wave. But why? What creates such a distortion? Ah, that's a good question. To have such a distortion, we need objects that are moving in a repeated way. And so one well-known source of gravitational waves is what we call binary stars. So binary stars are two stars that are bound together by gravity. They attract each other and they move around each other. Now, because these stars are massive, they distort space-time as any other massive object. But since they move all the time in a periodic manner, the distortion that is created also moves. A wave is created, a wave of space-time distortion. And this is what we call a gravitational wave. And this wave propagates? How? Where? Yes, this wave propagates through the universe. And actually, as long as the two stars are moving around each other, waves are continuously created and propagating away from the stars. Now, while the wave propagates, they distort space and time. So if we place two objects along the trajectory, the distance between these two objects will change. It increases and then decreases and then it increases again and so on. And does this last forever? No, because when the system emits gravitational wave, it loses energy. The gravitational waves carry energy away from the system. And so as a consequence, the two stars get closer to each other and then they start to move around each other faster, which means that they will emit a gravitational wave with even more energy. And this goes on. So the two stars get closer and closer to each other and the gravitational waves that are emitted are more and more energetic. And at some point, the two stars are so close to each other that they merge together to form a single star. And at this point, the emission of gravitational waves stops. Wow, and can we see these gravitational waves with our telescopes? We cannot really see them, not with our eyes, because they are not luminous. But we, ca we can detect them, we can feel them. We have actually special detectors that are called interferometers, with which we are able to feel the presence of a gravitational wave. These detectors are made of mirrors. They have two arms perpendicular to each other with mirror at each end. Now when a gravitational wave passes, the distance between the mirror are distorted by the wave. One arm gets very, very slightly longer, while the other one gets very, very slightly smaller. We then compare the lengths of the two arms. More precisely, we send a signal towards the end of the two arms and we compare the time it takes for it to travel back and forth. If the two signals come back at exactly the same times, then it means that the length of the two arms is the same and there is no gravitational wave passing. 
On the other hand, if one signal arrives first, then it means that the two arms have a different length, and so we have detected a gravitational wave. And did we ever detect one of them? Yes, we did. Actually, the first time that we detected a gravitational wave was quite recently, in 2015, with two detectors in the US called LIGO. Since then, we have already detected 90 gravitational waves with LIGO and also another detector in Italy called Virgo. And Kagra in Japan will soon join the game. Now, in the future, we will have even more precise interferometers like the Einstein telescope, the Cosmic Explorer, and then LISA that will be in space. And with these detectors, we expect to observe a million of gravitational waves. So it's really a new way of observing the universe that is starting right now. But what can we learn from these gravitational waves? So first, we learn about the system that is emitting the gravitational wave. So I said that binary system of stars were source of gravitational wave. Now, for us to be able to detect these gravitational waves, we need actually specific type of stars. We need objects that are dense and compact enough that the distortion of space-time that is created is big enough for our detector to fill them. And we have actually two types of objects like that. The first one is what we call neutron stars. So neutron stars, we believe, are the densest object, the densest star that we have in the universe. Neutron stars are stars that have burned all the hydrogen and helium, and then they start to collapse due to their own mass. During this process, all the protons in the star transform into neutrons. That's why we call such a star a neutron star. And this star stops collapsing because the pressure of the neutrons counteracts gravity. But for this to happen, the neutrons need to be very, very close to each other. So the star is extremely compact, extremely dense. If we compare it with the Sun, a neutron star is slightly heavier than the Sun. Its mass is typically between 1.1 times the mass of the Sun and 2 times the mass of the Sun. However, a neutron star is much, much smaller than the Sun. Its radius is 70,000 times smaller. It's only 10 kilometers. So a neutron star is extremely dense. And because this neutron star distorts space-time very strongly, when we have two neutron stars bound together that emit gravitational waves, the gravitational waves that are emitted are actually very strong, strong enough that we can detect them with our interferometers. And so by measuring these gravitational waves, we can actually learn something about the neutron stars that are very exotic objects in the universe. Those are very strange objects indeed. You said there was another type of object that emits strong gravitational wave? Yes, and if you found neutron star very strange, this second type of object will blow your mind. What's that? Black holes. Black holes are objects that are so dense that they create an extremely strong distortion of space-time. They create a well so deep that nothing can escape it. And that's why we call them black holes. Even light is trapped inside the hole of a black hole and cannot come out of it. To escape from a black hole, a signal should travel faster than the speed of light, which is simply impossible. Ah, yes, I've heard about it. There is an extremely massive black hole at the center of a galaxy, right? Called Sagittarius A star, which is 4 million times heavier than the Sun? Yes, there is. And actually, the Event Horizon Telescope took a picture of these black holes very recently. Actually, they could not see the black hole directly because, by definition, it's dark. It does not emit any light. But around the black hole, there is matter that is orbiting very fast due to the distortion of space-time generated by the black hole. And this matter emits strong light. And this is what the Event Horizon Telescope were able to detect. So they could see a ring of light and then, in the middle, a hole, which was the black hole. Now, what is amazing is that there are in a universe binary system of black holes. So two black holes that are bound together by gravity and that turn around each other. And these system of black holes emit strong gravitational waves that we were able to detect with LIGO and VIRGO. 
Fantastic. So by looking at these gravitational waves, you can learn about black holes? Yes, we can. We can learn, for example, about their mass. And so, for example, the black holes that emitted the gravitational waves that we were able to detect with LIGO and Virgo were much less massive than the black holes that we have at the center of our galaxy. The mass of these black holes was something like 30 times the mass of the Sun. By looking at the waves, we can also learn about the distance at which the system is with respect to us. And then, even more importantly and interestingly for our cosmologists, we can also learn about the theory of gravity. We can actually test the validity of general relativity. So we compare the gravitational waves that we observe with our interferometer with the prediction that we make assuming the theory of general relativity. And if the two are the same, then it means that general relativity has passed the test, but if the two are different, then it can mean that the theory of gravity is something else than general relativity. Is this what you did in your study, to test general relativity? No, we didn't do that in our study. What we did is to study if the fact that the system of black holes is moving with respect to us could invalidate our test of general relativity. So, for example, if we could conclude that general relativity is wrong, even if it is not, or vice versa. You see, the two black holes are moving around each other, but they are also moving together with respect to us. They are not static in the universe, they live in a galaxy and they move inside the galaxy. And this galaxy is part of a cluster of galaxies and also move in this cluster. Usually people ignore this effect when they do the calculation to predict the form of the gravitational wave. So they compare a gravitational wave emitted by a system which is moving with a calculation made assuming that the system is not moving. The question we wanted to answer in our study is does the motion of the system with respect to us change the form of the gravitational wave? So could we, for example, conclude that general relativity is wrong because the comparison between observation and the calculation shows a discrepancy? But actually, this discrepancy would be only due to the fact that we have ignored the motion of the system in our calculation, so that our calculation is not precise enough. And is it the case? No, fortunately, it's not. So what we have found is that the motion of the system definitely has an impact on the gravitational waves. So for example, if we have a system which is moving towards us, the mass that we will measure, the mass of the black holes, will be slightly heavier than it is in reality. Similarly, the motion of the system can change the apparent distance of the system with respect to us. We have also found that the motion will aberrate the system. For example, suppose that the black holes are moving in a plane like that. Now, if the system moves, we will have the impression that the black holes are moving in a plane that is rotated with respect to the true plane. It's actually a well-known effect in optics, and in our study we showed that aberration works exactly in the same way for gravitational waves, which is something that has never been studied before. So we showed that the motion of the system definitely has an impact on the form of the gravitational waves, but what is important is that this impact, this motion, will not invalidate our test of general relativity. So you will not conclude that general relativity is wrong because the system is moving? No, we will not. So this means that this system provides a very robust way of testing general relativity. So if we find a discrepancy between the observed signal and our calculation, then this really means that general relativity is wrong. So far, with the precision of the interferometers that we have, general relativity has passed all the tests. It is consistent with all of our observations. The future will tell us if this remains true when we have more precise observation with the Einstein telescope and with LISA. Thanks a lot for this explanation about gravitational waves and your work. My pleasure. I hope that you enjoyed this video about the research that I do at the University of Geneva. This work was actually an international collaboration with researchers in France and in the UK. So if you like the video, stay tuned. More will come about cosmology and test of general relativity.